ancient Greeks considered it unseemly to give public praise to women for their good looks, but apparently thought it did no harm to young men. Note that, unlike our own popular playwrights in England and the United States, the great Athenians scorned what we call love interest and regarded sex appeal as indecent. Truth. Listen to the words put into the mouth of Aeschylus by Aristophanes. He boasts of how he made the Greeks crave, like lions that dash at the face of the foe, and leap to the call of the trumpet. But no thinner beer have I given you, no. No Phaedra, no heroine's trumpet. Oh, it's no use. This open air experiment's no good. Or else they haven't the knack of attracting an audience. I'm afraid I must have bored you terribly. Oh, no, sir. No, no. It sounded a bit heathenish at first, almost as if you believed in them queer old gods. I talked to my missus about it. You see, sir, she's, she's keen on the Salvation Army and likes good serious talk. But when you said last Sunday that God was there all along, whatever they called him, oh, I knew it was all right. I never thought much of myself as a speaker, but I, I've never lost my whole audience before. Oh, not at all, sir. I've heard worse. But there's two things that no speaker can stand up against. What are they, may I ask? One's a band, the other's a fight. The Salvation Army knows that. They always has a band. Well, I'm off duty now that your meeting's over, sir. I'll uh, take you across, if you like. Thank you. There's a special attraction this Sunday. There's uh, Major Barbara. Major Barbara? How can a woman be a major? Oh, she can in the Army, sir. Or a sergeant, or a colonel, or even a general. Really? Yeah. If you want a tip or two on how to gather a meeting and hold it, you might do worse than hear her take the Sunday service. I will. I have a fancy for collecting religious experiences. <laughs> Amid all the poverty and ugliness of our lives here, the sin and the suffering, the grime and the smoke, the toil and the struggle, you know, and I know, that God is with us always and everywhere. We don't need a cathedral to worship him in. Here beneath God's open sky, we can draw nearer to him. Some of you feel him near you even now and feel too how much you need him. Won't you let him come into your life now, today, as so many have done before? You want his strength, his guidance, his comfort. And you need his forgiveness and friendship. Some of you turn away from him in bitterness at the hardship of your lives, saying that you do not want God. You want happiness and beauty. God will give you both. There is no beauty like the beauty of the newly saved who has found the unspeakable happiness that only the consciousness of God's presence and love can give. We in the army have our daily trials. Most of us are as poor as you are, but we are all happy. And the mark of that happiness is on us all for you to see. The rich are not happy. The poor have only to reach out their hands for God's happiness and take it. Is there anyone here who has courage enough to raise his hand as a sign that he would like us to pray for him. Make the decision now. In your need and loneliness, God can meet with you. There must be someone here who feels that he should raise his hand, but it isn't easy. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. You've done it often enough to beckon to your child or to stop a trolley car. You feel too shy, perhaps. Never mind. I will pray for him, and God will give him the courage of a lion. Come, do not keep God waiting. Thousands have done it, and if you can find me one who has done it and been sorry afterwards, I will put off this dear uniform and never pray again. Come. Come. I know there is someone. Ah, oh, I found him. Let the brave gentleman come to the front. Make room for him, please. Give me your hand, dear brother. Will you come with me to our shelter where we pray together? Friends, you will now sing How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. Oh, <laughs> 
pray a little together. May I tell you to forget that we've never met before? You mustn't be shy and distant with me. I can see that all's well with you. I can see in your face the new happiness that has just come into your life. You're a new man. You're saved. You feel that, don't you? Listen to me, Major Barbara. I'm, uh, I'm here on false pretenses. It is true that a new happiness has come into my life. A happiness which I never quite believed in. But at any rate, I thought would never come into my life. It has come. Thank God. Take care. It hasn't made me a better man. It's made me an utterly unscrupulous one. What do you mean? Look at me. Look deep into my eyes. Is the new happiness that you see there the kind of happiness you're thinking of? It must be. There's no other happiness like it. It gladdens my heart because, under God, I have brought it there. Good. Now, let me warn you, though I'm a scholar and a gentleman, I'm as poor as a church mouse, like all scholars. I'm no good for anything in the way of worldly success. But what does that matter? We're all poor here. We never think of money or success. When all our money's spent, we pray for more. And it comes, it always comes. <laughs> Take your mind off such things. And now, shall we pray together? I never pray, at least not in your way. The new thing that's come to me is not that I'm saved. I was saved when I was five years old, when I first swallowed your religion. Since then, I've swallowed 20 religions. It's my life's work. I'm interested in the essence of all religions, not in their catchwords or in yours. Let us find it for you here. We can. Nonsense. I have more to teach you about religion than you could yet imagine. You think so? Then why have you come here with me? Why did you hold up your hand? Because I have impulses that I cannot explain. They come very seldom, but when they come, nothing can stop me. There's an end of my conscience, of my prudence, of my reason. Such an impulse seized me the moment I saw you. You may be poor. Our table manners may be different. Our relatives may not mix. Probably everything is against our associating with each other. No matter. I will join the army. I will put on a uniform and beat the drum. In short, I am hopelessly and forever in love with you. And will follow you to the end of the world until you marry me. Is that plain? And now, will you begin by seeing me home? I should like to put you through your first trial by showing you where I live and introducing you to my family. God has some little surprises for you, my friend. Have we far to go? What about a taxi? We don't run to taxis in this part of the world. Most of us have never been in one. We have to take a bus. Well, there's a 73. Jump in. Ring. I have a latch key. By the way, I'd better know your name before I go in. Well, you haven't mentioned yours, and it's I that have to introduce you. My name's Adolphus Cousins. Adolphus? What a name. I shall call you Dolly. My relatives do. I wish they didn't. Introduce me as Professor Cousins. Allude to me as Miss Undershaft. Undershaft. Not Undershaft, the Cannon King. The rival of Krupp and Skoda, the multimillionaire. Don't worry, Dolly. I haven't seen him since I was that high. You'll find my mother much more terrifying. First time we caught a bus here, Major? Yes, and you wanted to take me home in a taxi. I've cured you of those extravagant ideas, haven't I? Yes. 
takes the daughter of a millionaire to teach economy to the penniless professor of Greek. Is anything the matter, Mother? Presently, Stephen. Don't begin to read, Stephen. I shall require all your attention. It was only when I was waiting. Now. I haven't kept you waiting very long, I think. Uh, not at all, Mother. Give me my cushion, please. Sit down. Don't fiddle with your tie, Stephen. There's nothing the matter with it. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Stephen, I really cannot bear the whole burden of our family affairs any longer. You must advise me. Really, Mother, I know so little about our family affairs. So impossible to mention some things to you. I suppose you mean your father. Yes? My dear, we can't go on all our lives not mentioning him. You're old enough now to be taken into my confidence and to help me deal with him about the girls. Oh, the girls are all right. They are engaged. Yes, I've made a very good match for Sarah. Charles Lomax will be a millionaire, 35. But in the meantime, his trustees cannot allow him more than 800 a year. Uh, yes, but... Uh, Sarah will have to find at least another 800. And what about Barbara? I thought Barbara was going to make the most brilliant career of all of you. And what does she do? Joins the Salvation Army and walks in one evening with a professor of Greek whom she's picked up in the street. Yes, I was rather taken aback when I heard they were engaged. Cousins is a very nice fellow, certainly. No one would ever guess that he was born in Australia. Oh, Adolphus Cousins will make a very good husband. After all, nobody can say a word against Greek. Oh, no, indeed. Besides, my dear, you must marry soon. I'm trying to arrange something for you. Don't sulk, Stephen. I'm not sulking, Mother. Well, what has all this to do with my father? My dear Stephen, where is the money to come from? You know how poor my father is. Whereas your father must be fabulously wealthy. There's no need to remind me of that, Mother. I've hardly ever been able to open a newspaper in my life without seeing our name in it. The undershaft quick fire, the undershaft torpedo, the undershaft submarine, and now the undershaft bomb. At Harrow, they called me the Woolwich Infant. And at Cambridge, some little beast spoilt my Bible on your first birthday present to me. My writing underneath my name, Son and heir to Undershaft and Lazarus, death and destruction dealers, address Christendom and Judea. But that wasn't so bad as the way people cowed out to me everywhere I went. Because my father was making millions by selling cannon. Exactly. That's why he's able to behave as he does, openly defying every social and moral obligation. It's criminal. But he does not actually break the law. He broke the law when he was born. His parents were not married. Mother, is that true? Of course it's true. That's why we separated. But this is frightful for me, Mother, to have to, to speak to you about such things. Now, be a good boy, Stephen, and listen to me. You see, the undershafts are descended from a foundling who was adopted by an armourer and gun maker. That was centuries ago. Ever since then, the cannon business has been left to an adopted foundling named Andrew Undershaft. Your father was adopted in that way. And he pretends to consider himself bound to carry on the tradition and adopt someone to leave the business too. But it was on my account, Mother, that your home life was broken up. I am sorry. Well, dear, there were other differences. I really cannot bear any moral man. Your father didn't exactly do wrong things, but he said them and thought them that was what was so dreadful. He really had a sort of religion of wrongness. I couldn't forgive him for preaching immorality while he practiced morality. All this simply bewilders me, Mother. Right is right and wrong is wrong. And if a man cannot distinguish them properly, he's either a fool or a rascal, and that's all. 
That's my own boy. Now that you understand the situation, what do you advise me to do? We cannot take money from him. After all, Stephen, our present income comes from your father. I never knew that. Why, dear boy, the Stevenages couldn't do everything for you. We gave you social position. Andrew had to contribute something. So you see, it isn't a question of taking money from him or not. It's simply a question of how much. I would die sooner than ask him for another penny. You mean that I must ask him? Very well, Stephen, it shall be as you wish. I've asked your father to come here this evening. Ring the bell, please. He may be here at any moment. Morrison, go and tell everyone to come to the drawing room at once. Yes, dear. Mother, are Charlie and Dolly to come in? Barbara, I will not have Charles call Charlie. The vulgarity of it possibly makes me ill. It's all right, Mother. Are they to come in? Yes, if they will behave themselves. Come in, Dolly, and behave yourself. Come in, Charlie! Sit down, all of you. Listen to me, children. Your father is coming here this evening. What? Oh, I say. You're not called on to say anything, Charles. Are you serious, Mother? Of course I'm serious. It's on your account, Sarah, and also on Charles's. I hope you're not going to object, Barbara. I? Why should I? My father has a soul to be saved like anybody else. He's quite welcome as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Well, uh, not that I mind him coming here. You know, first Sarah doesn't. Thank you. Adolphus, have I your permission to invite my own husband to my own house? You have my unhesitating support in everything you do, Lady Britt. I wonder how the old boy will take it. Much as the old girl will, no doubt, Charles. No, no I didn't mean it. At least I... You didn't think, Charles. You never do. The result is you never mean anything. Now, please attend to me, children. Your father will be quite a stranger to us. I suppose he hasn't seen Sarah since she was a little kid, really. Not since she was a little kid, Charles. As you express it with that elegance of diction and refinement of thought that seemed never to desert you. Accordingly... Might I... might I speak a word to my lady? Nonsense. Show him in. Yes, my lady. Does Morrison know who it is? Of course. Morrison's always been with us. It must be a regular corker for him, don't you know? Is this a moment to get on my nerves, Charles? No, but this is something out of the ordinary. Really, I, I never expected to meet the, the mystery man of Europe. The, uh, Mr. Undershaft. How do you do, my dear? You look a good deal older. I am somewhat older. Time has stood still with you. Rubbish. This is your family. Is it so large? I'm sorry to say my memory is failing very badly in some things. Ah, I can see that you're my eldest. Uh, 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 I'm very glad to meet you again, my boy. No, 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 no. Andrew, do you mean to say you don't remember how many children you have? Well, I must confess I recollect only one son. So many things have happened since then, of Andrew, course. Andrew, you're talking nonsense. Of course you have only one son. That is Charles Lomax, who is engaged to Sarah. My dear sir, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I'll talk about it, I'll talk. This is Stephen. Happy to make your acquaintance, Mr. Stephen. Huh? Ah, then you must be my son. How are you, my young friend? He's very like you, my love. Uh, no, you, you flatter me, Mr. Undershaft. My name is Cousins, engaged to Barbara. This is Major Barbara Undershaft of the Salvation Army. This is Sarah, your second daughter. And uh, that is uh, Stephen Undershaft, your son. My dear Stephen, I beg your pardon. Not at all. Mr. Cousins, I'm much indebted to you for explaining so precisely. Barbara, my dear. 
Sarah. Oh, Sarah, of course. Barbara. I am right this time, I hope. Quite right. Sit down, all of you. Sit down, Andrew. Thank you, my love. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. It takes some time to find out exactly where you are, doesn't it? That's not what embarrasses me, Mr. Lomax. My difficulty is that if I play the part of a father, I should produce the effect of an intrusive stranger. If I play the part of a discreet stranger, I may appear a callous father. There's no need for you to play any part at all, Andrew. You'd much better be sincere, natural. Yes, my dear. I dare say that will be best. Well, here I am. Now, what can I do for you all? You need not do anything, Andrew. You're one of the family. You can sit with us and enjoy yourself. <coughs> what on earth is this, Morrison? Your hot lemon and ginger, sir. Always at a quarter past nine. Your memory seems to be a great deal better than mine. <coughs> Charles Lomax, if you can behave yourself, behave yourself. If not, leave the room. I'm awfully sorry, lady, but, but really, no, pun myself. Why don't you laugh if you want to, Charlie? It's good for your inside. Barbara, you've had the education of a lady. Please let your father see that, and don't talk like a street girl. Never mind me, my dear. As you know, I'm not a gentleman, and I was never educated. Oh, but nobody did know it, I assure you. You look all right, you know. Well, thank you very much. Charlie, I think you'd better play something for us. Oh, perhaps that sort of thing isn't in your line. I'm particularly fond of music. Are you? Well, you mustn't expect too much. Do you play, Barbara? Only the tambourine, but it's useful for taking the collections in at the end of our meetings. It's not my doing, Andrew. Barbara's old enough to go her own way. She has no father to advise her. Oh, yes, she has. There are no orphans in the Salvation Army. Your father there has a great many children and plenty of experience, hmm? How did you come to understand that? Charles, play us something at once. One moment, Mr. Lomax. I'm rather interested in the Salvation Army. Its motto might be my own. Blood and fire. But, but not your sort of blood and fire, no? Come down tomorrow to my shelter at Limehouse and see what we're doing. We're going to march to a great meeting at the Albert Hall. Come and see the shelter and then march with us. It'll do you a lot of good. Can you play anything? In my youth, I earned pennies and even shillings occasionally in the streets and public house parlors by my natural talent for step dancing. Later on, I became a member of our factory's orchestral society and performed passably on the tenor trombone. Well, that's splendid. Many a sinner has played himself into heaven on the trombone, thanks to the army. Really, Barbara, you go on as if religion were a pleasant subject. Do have some sense of propriety. I don't find it an unpleasant subject, my dear. It's the only one capable people really care for. Well, if you're determined to have it, I insist on having it in a proper and respectable way. This seems to be an admirable occasion for family prayers. Oh, I say. Charles, ring the bell. I'm afraid I must be going. You can't go so soon, Andrew. It'd be most improper. Well, sit down. My dear, I have conscientious scruples. May I suggest a compromise? If Barbara will conduct a little service elsewhere, I'll attend it willingly. I'll even take part if a trombone can be procured. Don't mock, Andrew. You don't think I'm mocking my love, I hope. No, of course not. And it wouldn't matter if you were. Half the army came to their first meeting for a joke. Come along to the nursery, Papa. Come on, Dolly. Dolly. I will not be disobeyed by everybody. Adolphus, sit down. Charles, you may go. You're not fit for prayers. You cannot keep your countenance. But you, Adolphus, can behave yourself if you choose to. I insist on your stay. My dear Lady Britt, there are things in the family prayer book that I couldn't bear to hear you say. What things, pray? Well, you'd have to say before everyone, we've done those things we ought not to have done. Left undone those things we ought to have done, and there's no health in us. And I couldn't bear to hear you doing yourself such an injustice. As to myself, I, I flat to deny it, so I must go. Well, go. And remember this, Adolphus. I have a very strong suspicion that you went to the Salvation Army to worship Barbara and nothing else. And I quite appreciate the very clever way in which you systematically humbug me. I found you out. Take care Barbara doesn't. That's all. Don't give me away. Sir, 
If you want to go, go. Anything's better than to sit there as if you wished you were a thousand miles away. Very well, Mama. Mother, what's the matter? Nothing. Foolishness. You can go with him too, if you like, and leave me alone. Oh, you mustn't think that, Mother. I don't like him. The others do. That's the injustice of a woman's lot. A woman has to bring up her children. That means to punish them, to deny them things they want, to do all the unpleasant things. And then the father, who has nothing to do but to pet them and spoil them, comes in when all her work is done and steals their affection from her. Have you ever saved a maker of cannons? No. Will you let me try? I'll make a bargain with you. If I go to see you tomorrow in your salvation shelter, will you come the day after to see me in my cannon works? Take care. It may end in your giving up the cannons for the sake of the Salvation Army. Are you sure it won't end in your giving up the Salvation Army for the sake of my cannons? I'll take my chance of that. And I'll take my chance of the other. Where is your shelter? In Limehouse, at the sign of the cross. Ask anybody in Chinatown. Where are your works? At Perivale St. Andrews, at the sign of the sword. Ask anybody in Europe. Yes, intelligent beyond the station of life into which it has pleased the capitalists to call me. And they don't like a man that sees through them. Yeah. And second, an intelligent human being needs a due share of happiness, so I drink something crude when I get the chance. Third, I stand up for my class and do as little as I can so as to leave off the job for my fellow workers. And fourth, I'm fly enough to know what's inside the law and what's outside it. And inside it, I do as the capitalists do, pinch what I can lay my hands on. What's your name? Price. Bronter O'Brien Price. Stoppy Price for short. What's yours? Rabbi Mitchins, sir. Your health, Miss Mitchins. Mrs. Mitchins? Mrs. Romola Mitchins. What? Oh, rummy, 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 respectable married woman getting rescued by the Salvation Army by pretending to be a bad and now. Same old game. But what was I to do? I can't starve. These Salvation lasses is dear good girls. But the better you are, the worse they like to think you was afore they rescued you. But why shouldn't they have their bit of credit, the poor loves? They're water rags by their work. And where would they get the money to rescue us if we was to let on that we was no worse than other people? That's right. You know what ladies and gentlemen are. Ah, oh, thieving swine. I wouldn't say no to their job, though, Romy, just the same. Who saved you, Mr. Price? Was it made to Barbara? No, I'll come here on my own. I'm going to be Bronte O'Brien Price, the converted painter. I know what they like. I'm going to tell them how I blasphemed and gambled and whopped me poor old mother. You used to, to beat your mother. Not likely. She used to beat me. You come and listen to the converted painter and you'll hear how she was a, a pious woman that taught me my prayers at her knee. And how I used to come home blind drunk and drag her out of bed by her snow white hair and lamb into her with a poker. That's what's so unfair to us women. Your confessions is just as big lies as ours is. Yeah. But you men could stand up and tell your lies right out at the meeting and be made much of for it. While the sort of confessions we has to make has to be whispered to one lady at a time. Take right, in spite of all their piety. Right? Do you suppose the Salvation Army'd be allowed if it went and did right? Not much. It combs our air and turns us into good little blokes to be robbed and put upon. 
that I can play the game as good as any of them, I'll... I'll see somebody struck by lightning or I'll hear a voice saying, Snobby Price, where will you spend eternity? Oh, I'll have a time with it, I can tell you. Come, pluck up. You'll be all right. Oh, poor old man. Cheer up, brother. You'll find rest and peace and happiness here. Yeah? Hurry up with the food, miss. He's fed down. I shan't be long. Buck up, Daddy. She's going to fetch you a nice thick slice of bread and scrape and a mug of sky blue. Keep up your old heart. Never say die. I ain't old, man. I'm only 49. Well, that grey pet's come in my ear before I was 30. Am I to be turned out in the street to starve for it? And my job given to a younger man what can't do it no better than I can? Well, no good jawing about it. You're only a jumped up, chucked off, hospital turned out incurable of an old working man who cares about you, away. Eh? You'll make the thieving swine give you a square meal. They stole them plenty from you. You get a bit of your own back. Ah, there we are, brother. Now. You ask a blessing and tuck that into you. Go on. There. Well, I, I never took nothing at all. Oh, come, come. The Lord wasn't above taking bread from his friends, so why should you be? Besides, when we find you a job, you can pay us for it if you like. Yes, miss. Yeah, that's right. I, I can pay you back. It's only a loan. Well, Rummy. Are you more comfortable today? Bless you, lovey. You fed my body and saved my soul, didn't you? You look ready to drop. Sit down and rest a bit. Oh, not yet, Rummy. There's more work than we can do. I mustn't stop. You try a prayer for just two minutes. You'll work all the better after. Oh, isn't it wonderful how a few minutes prayer revives you? I was quite lightheaded this morning. I was so tired. Major Barbara just sent me to pray for five minutes and I was able to go on as if I'd only just begun. Did you have a piece of bread, Mr. Price? Yes, miss, but I got the piece that I value more and that's the piece that passes whole understanding. Glory, hallelujah. Oh, that makes me so happy. When you say that, I feel wicked for loitering here. Oh, I must get to work again. Oh, 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 oh. There you go. Hi. Hi. Hello, Bill. Can't you go? Gah. <laughs> I know you. You're the one what took my girl away, aren't you? You're the one what set her against me. Well, I've come to get her out, see? Tell her Bill Walker wants to see her. She'll know what that means. And you start to jaw back at me and I'll start on you, do you hear? There's your way. In you go. <laughs> Easy there, mate. She ain't done you no harm. Who are you calling, mate? Standing up for her, are you? Put up your hands. You great brute! Oh, God forgive you. How could you strike an old woman like that? You go and forgive me again, and I'll go and forgive you one on the jaw that'll stop you praying for a week. Have you anything to say against that? No, mate. She ain't nothing to do with me. No. Good job for you, you staff care. Now. Are you going to fetch out Moggy, but Jim, and I'm going to knock your block off and fetch her out myself, eh? Oh, please, someone go in and tell Major Barbara. Uh, you want to tell your Major and me, do you? Please don't drag my hair. Let me go. Do you or don't you? Yes or no? Oh, God. Give me strength. <laughs> go on, show her that and tell her, if she wants one like it, to come and interfere with me. Here, finish your mess and get out of my way. You'll take a liberty with me and I'll bash your face with this mug and cut your eye out. Coming, shoving and bullying your way in here with a bread of charity is sickening in our stomachs. What good are you, you old palsy maggot? What good are you? As good as you and better. I'll do a day's work again, you or any other fat young soaker of your age. Well, what do you know? Not even how to behave yourself. Coming in here and lying your dirty fist across the mouth of a respectable woman. <laughs> Don't provoke me to lay it across yours, do you hear? Yeah, you'd like to eat a old man, wouldn't you? After you done with the women, I ain't seen you eat a young man yet. You lie, you old soup kitchen, are you? There was a young man here just now. Did I offer to eat him or did I not? Was he starving or was he not? Was he a man? 
Or just a cross-eyed thief and a loafer. Would you eat my son-in-law's brother? Who is he? Touch your fair mile, the ball's pond. Him what won the 20 pound off the Japanese wrestler at the music hall for standing up again him for 17 minutes, 14 seconds. I ain't no music hall wrestler. Can he box? Yes, and you can't. What? I can't, can't I? What's that you say? Will you box Todger Fairmile if I put him on to I'll you? I'll stand up to any man alive if he was ten Todger Fairmiles, but I don't set up to be a professional. Here, yeah, what am I doing talking to an old matter like you for? I'm going in there to fix her uh, You're going to be carried to the police station on a stretcher, more likely. You mind what you're about. Why haven't you heard that the Major Yard is a grand order, no? Yeah. Uh, you see. Well, I ain't done nothing to her. Suppose she says you did. Who's going to believe you? God, there ain't no justice in this country. I'm as good as her. Tell her so. It's what a fool like you would do. Good morning. Morning. Sit down. Make yourself at home. Now then. Since you've made friends with us, we want to know all about you. Name and trades, please. Peter Shirley. Fitter. Chucked out of my job two months ago because I was too old. You'd pass still. Why didn't you dye your hair? I did. And my age came out at the coroner's inquest in my daughter. Steady. Gee, told you. Never out of a job before. Good worker and sent to the scrap heap. No matter. If you did your part, God will do his. My religion's no concern to nobody but myself. I know. Secularist. Did I offer to deny it? Why should you? My own father's a secularist, I think. Our father, yours and mine, fulfills himself in many ways. And I dare say he knew what he was about when he made a free thinker of you. So buck up, Peter. We can always find a job for a steady man like you. What's your name? What's that to you? Afraid to give his name. Any trade? Who's afraid to give his name? If you've got a charge to bring against me, bring it. My name's... Bill Walker. Bill Walker? Oh, you're the man that little Jenny Hill was praying for inside just now. Who's Jenny Hill and what call she got to pray for me? I don't know. Perhaps it was you that cut her lip. Yes, it was me what cut her lip. I ain't afraid of you. How can you be, since you're not afraid of God? You're a brave man, Mr. Walker. It takes some pluck for us to carry on our work here, but none of us dare lift a hand against a girl like that for fear of her father in heaven. I don't want any of your cat in jaw, see? I suppose you think I came here to beg from you like this damaged lot here. Not me. I don't want none of your bread and scrape. And I don't believe in your gourd, neither. No more than what you do yourself. Oh, I beg your pardon for putting your name down, Mr. Walker. I didn't understand. I'll strike it out. Here, you let my name alone. Ain't my name good enough to go in your book? Well, you see, there's not much point me putting your name down if I can't do anything for you. What's your trade? That's no concern of yours. Quite so. I'll put you down as the man who struck poor little Jenny Hill in the mouth. I see. I've had enough of this. What did you come here for? I came for my girl, see? I came to take her out of this and to break her jaw for her. You see, I was right about your trade. What's her name? No, no. Mog Habijam, that's what her name is. Mog. Mog Habijam. Oh, she's gone to Tower Bridge to our shelter there. Has she? Then I'm going to the Tower Bridge after Here. Are you lying to me so as you can get shot of me? I don't want to get shot of you. I want to keep you here and save your soul. You better stay. You're going to have a bad time today, Bill. Who's going to give it to me? You, Prep. Someone you don't believe in. But you'll be glad afterwards. Yes. Well, I'm going to the Tower Bridge to get out the reach of your tongue. And if I don't find Mog there, I'll come back and I'll do two years for you. Sell me if I don't. It's no use, Bill. She's got another bloke. What's that? He fell in love with her when he saw her with her soul saved and her face clean and her hair washed. Well, what did she wash it for, the carroty cat? It's red. It's quite lovely now, because she wears a new look in her eyes to go with it. It's a pity you're too late, Bill. 
The new bloke's put your nose right out of joint. I'll put his nose out of joint for him. Not that I care to curse for air, mind that. But I'll teach her to drop me as if I was dead. And I'll teach him to meddle with my duty. What's his bleeding name? Sergeant Todger Fairmile. I'll go with him, miss. I want to see them two meet. And I'll take him to the infirmary when it's over. Here. Is, uh, is that him what you were speaking of? That's him. In what wrestle with the jet? That's him. Only he's given up fighting for religion. So he's a bit fresh for want of exercise, but he'd be very glad to see you. Come along. Here. Yeah. What's his weight? Fourteen five. Go and talk to him, Bill. He'll convert you. He'll convert your head into a mashed potato. I ain't afraid of him. I ain't afraid of nobody. But he can lick me. She's done me. You ain't going. I thought not. Jenny. Jenny. Yes, ma'am. Just send Rummy Mitchum's out here to clear away. Oh, I think she's afraid. Nonsense. You still, she's told. Rummy. Rummy, the major says you must come. Oh, all right. I'm coming then. Poor little Jenny. Are you tired? Does it hurt? Oh, no, it's all right now. It's nothing. It was as hard as he could hit, I expect. Poor Bill. You don't feel angry with him, do you? Oh, no, no, indeed I don't, Major. Bless his poor heart. Now, come on, Rummy, bustle. Take him these mugs and plates to be washed and throw those crumbs about for the birds. There ain't got to be no crumbs. This ain't a time to waste good bread on birds. Major! Major! Oh, well, my dear! Hello, Papa, so you kept your promise. I get the law on you, you flashy head pig nose pop, Oliver, you! If she let me, you're no gentleman, you might treat a lady in the face! You're in with you, before you get yourself into more trouble. Huh. I ain't never had the pleasure of being introduced to you, as I can remember. <laughs> Welcome to the shelter, sir. Look at old Beaver! <laughs> What's the matter? Don't talk to me, do you hear? You leave me alone or I'll do you a mischief. I'm dead under your feet, anyhow. Don't you be afeard. You won't as prime company as you need expect to be sort of. Get on that, will you? Oh, there you are, Mr. Shirley. This is my father. I told you he was a secularist, didn't I? Perhaps you'll be able to comfort one another. A secularist? Not the least in the world. On the contrary, I'm a confirmed mystic. I'm sorry. By the way, Papa, what is your religion, in case I have to introduce you again? My religion? My dear, I'm a millionaire. That's my religion. Well, then I'm afraid you and Mr. Shirley won't be able to comfort one another after all. You're not a millionaire, are you, Peter? No. I'm proud of it. Poverty, my friend, isn't a thing to be proud of. Who made your millions for you? Me and my like. What kept us poor? Keeping you rich. I wouldn't have your conscience, not for all your income. And I wouldn't have your income, not for all your conscience, Mr. Shirley. You wouldn't think he was my father, would you, Peter? Will you go into the kitchen and lend the lass as a hand? Oh, yes, I... I'm in their debt for a meal, ain't I? No, not because you're in their debt, but for love of them, Peter, for love of them. Dear, now, don't stare at me. In with you and give that conscience of yours a holiday. Oh, never mind me, my dear. You just go about your work and let me watch it for a while. Very well, Papa. For instance, what's the matter with this outpatient over here? Oh, we'll cure him in no time. Just wait. It would be nice just to stamp on Mog Habijam's face, wouldn't it, Bill? It's a lie. I never said so. Who told you what was in my mind? Only your new friend. What new friend? The devil, Bill. When he gets round people, they get miserable, just like you. I ain't miserable. Well, if you're happy, why don't you look happy as we do? I'm happy enough, I tell you. Why can't you leave me alone? What have I done to you? I ain't smashed your face in, have I? It's not me that's getting at you, Bill. Who else is it? 
somebody that doesn't intend you to smash women's faces, I suppose. Somebody or something that wants to make a man of you. Like a man of me? Ain't I a man? I? Who says I'm not a man? Well, there's a man in you somewhere, I suppose, but why did he let you go and smash little Jenny Hill's face? Now, that wasn't very manly of him, was it? I've done with it, I tell you. Chuck it. I'm sick of your Jenny Hill and her silly face. Then why do you keep thinking about it? Why does it keep coming up against you in your mind? You're not getting converted, are you, Bill? Not me, not likely. That's the spirit. Hold out against it. Put out your strength. Don't let's get you cheap. Todger Fairmile said he wrestled against his salvation harder than he ever wrestled with the Jap at the music hall. He gave in to the Jap when his arm was going to break, but he didn't give in to his salvation until his heart was going to break. Or well, perhaps you'll escape that. You haven't any heart, have you, Bill? Why ain't I got a heart? Same as what anybody else has. Well, a man with a heart wouldn't have smashed poor little Jenny Hill's face, would he? Leave me alone, will you? Have I ever meddled with you? Nagging and provoking me like this? It's your soul that's hurting you, Bill. And not me. We've been through it all ourselves. Come with us, Bill. To brave manhood on earth and eternal glory in heaven. Come. Oh, there you are, Dolly. I want to introduce a new friend of mine. Mr. Bill Walker. Bill. This is my bloke, Mr. Cousins. What? Going to marry him? Yes. Heaven help him. Heaven help him. Why, don't you think he'll be happy with me? Well, I've only had to stand it for an afternoon. He'll have to stand it for a lifetime. That is a frightful reflection, Mr. Walker, but I can't tear myself away from her. Well, I can. Here. Do you know where I'm going to and what I'm going to do? Yes, you're going to heaven, and you're coming back here before the week's out to tell me you so. You lie. I'm going to tie a breach to spit in Todger Fairmile's eye. I bashed Jenny Hill's face in. Well, now I'll get my own face bashed and come back and show it to her. He'll hit me harder than what I hit her. That'll make us square. Is that fair or is it not? You're a gentleman. You ought to know. But two black eyes won't make one white one, Bill. Can't you never keep your mouth shut? I asked the gentleman. Yes, I think you're right, Mr. Walker. Yes, I should do it. It's curious. It's exactly what an ancient Greek would have done. But what good will it do? Well, it'll give Mr. Fairmire some exercise and it'll satisfy Mr. Walker's soul. There ain't no such thing as a soul. How can you tell whether I've got a soul or not? You ain't never seen it. I've seen it. Hurting you when he went against it. If you was my girl and took the words out of my mouth like that, I'd give you something you'd feel it, you know, I would. You take my tip, mate. Stop her jaw. Or you'll die afore your time. War I. That's what you'll be. War I. I wonder. Dory. Yes, my dear, it's very wearing being in love with you. If it lasts, I quite think I shall die young. Should you mind? Not in the least. Well. Oh, Papa. We've not forgotten you. Ready, miss. Yes, I'm coming, Snobby. Now, Dolly, explain the place to Papa. And don't get up to any mischief, you two. Once the rowdiest pub in the district, Barbara has converted it. She's quite original in her methods. Barbara Undershaft would be. Her inspiration comes from within herself. It's the undershaft inheritance. I shall hand on my torch to my daughter. She shall make my converts and preach my gospel. What? Money and gunpowder? Yes, money and gunpowder. Freedom and power. Command of life and command of death. This is extremely interesting, Mr. Undershaft. Of course you know you're mad. And you? Oh, mad as a hatter. You're welcome to my secret, and I've discovered yours. I'm astonished. Can a madman make cannon? Would anyone else but a madman make them? And now, question for question, can a sane woman make a man of a waster or a woman of a worm? Are there two mad people or three in the shelter today? You mean Barbara is as mad as we are? My dear professor, let's call things by their proper names. I am a millionaire. You're a Greek scholar. Barbara is a savior of souls. What have we three to do with the common mob of slaves and idolaters? Take care. Barbara is in love with the common people, so am I. Have you never felt the romance of that love? Romance? You ever been in love with poverty like St. Francis? You ever been in love with dirt like St. Simeon? You ever been in love with disease and suffering like our nurses and philanthropists? Such passions are unnatural. This love of the common people may please an earl's granddaughter and a university professor. But I've been a poor man. 
and a common man. And it has no romance for me. Leave it to the poor to pretend that poverty is a blessing. We know better than that. We three must stand together above the common people and help their children to climb up beside us. Barbara must belong to us, not to the Salvation Army. Well, I can only say that if you think you can get her away from the Salvation Army by talking to her as you've been talking to me, then you don't know Barbara. My friend, I never ask for what I can buy. Do I understand you to imply that you can buy Barbara? No, but I can buy the Salvation Army. Tell that to Barbara if you dare. I've hardly ever seen them so much moved as they were by your confession, Mr. Price. I could almost be glad to make past wickedness of it adapt to keep others straight. Oh, it will, Snobby. It will. Oh, Father, we've just had the most wonderful experience. Snobby Price drew our biggest crowd for months. Jimmy, how much? Four and tenpence, Major. Oh, Snobby, if you'd given your poor mother just one more kick, we should have got the whole five shillings. If she heard you say that, Miss, she'd be sorry I didn't. Oh, what a joy it'll be to her when she hears I'm saved. Shall I contribute the odd tuppence, Barbara? The millionaire's might, hmm? How did you make that tuppence? As usual, my dear, by selling cannons, torpedoes and submarines. Put it back in your pocket. You can't buy your salvation here for tuppence. You must work it out. Isn't tuppence enough? I could afford a little more if you pressed me. Two million millions would not be enough. Your kind of money is no use. Take it away. Dolly, you must write another letter to the papers oh. for me. Oh, I know you don't like it, but it must be done. The general says we've got to close the shelter. We can't get more money. I... I force the collections at the meetings until I'm ashamed, don't I, Snobby? Oh, it's a fair treat to see the way you work it, Major. The way you got them up from three and six to four and ten in that hymn, penny by penny and verse by verse, was a caution. Not a cheap jack on my land waste could have touched her at it. Excuse me, sir. I wish we could do without it. What use are these hatfuls of pennies and halfpennies? We want thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. I want to convert people, not to be always begging for the army in a way I'd sooner die than beg for myself. But how are we to feed them? I can't talk religion to a man with bodily hunger in his eyes. Oh, it's frightful. Oh, Major, dear. Now, don't comfort me, Jenny. It's all right. We'll get the money. How? By praying for it, of course. It was the general. She's coming to march with us to our big meeting. And she's very anxious to meet you. For some reason or other. Perhaps she'll convert you. My dear, I shall be delighted. and put some gin in it. Dog's nose, right on that. You all know who I am. Now, who are you? Todger Fairmile. <laughs> Champion boxer, wrestler, and swimmer. Good old Todger. <laughs> some of you have put money on me and won it. And some of us have lost it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll lose no more money that way. I may ask you for a penny or two presently to put in the young lass's tambourine. I've been promoted sergeant in the Salvation Army. Yes, it's easier than fighting, ain't it? No, Corky. It's not easier. But it's ever so much happier. And who told you I'd given up fighting? I was born a fighter, and please God, I'll die a fighter. But the ring was too small for a champion like me. It was no satisfaction to me to knock out some poor fellow who'd been set up against me for a purse of money. I held his shoulders down on the mat. It was too easy. And there was no future in it for either of us. You don't say so. One day, I gave an exhibition spa for the benefit of charity. Our general was there, and I was introduced to her. She said to me, I was a wonderful young man. <laughs> and she asked me, was I saved? 
No, says I. But I can go 15 rounds with Tommy Farr if you'd like to put up the money. Oh. <laughs> of course you can, she said. But can you go? Not 15 rounds, but eternity. With the devil, for no money at all. Well, I tried to make light of it. But it stuck. And a week later, I took the count for the first time, and I joined up. And now, I fight the devil all the time. And I'll say this for him, Corky. He fights fairer and harder than some champs we've tackled. But God is against him. And in that sign, we shall conquer. Now, shall we have another him? You're Todger Fairmile, are you? Sergeant Fairmile, at your service. You're the one what took my girl away, are you? Now I'm a mug of Bill! Don't you know me? Blimey, it's her voice. Here, here, what have you done to yourself? What's he done to you? Sergeant, it's Bill Walker, that was my bloke. And I've said, change, he doesn't know me. We'll make the same change in you, Bill. Is that what you've come for? I've come to get my face changed right enough. And you're the one what's going to change it. Take that. Go on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here's my jaw. Go on, hit it. Hit it your best. Break it. Oh, that I should be found worthy to be spit upon for the gospel's sake. Hit it. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Billy shouldn't have done that. You've spit in the face of your salvation. Listen here, you. Do you know I slept with a girl named Jenny Hill? What are your lime ass lasses? We do. Has she converted you? Keep your mind off this conversion business and listen to what I'm saying. I broke Jenny Hill's jaw this morning. Oh, no, you didn't, Bill. It ain't so easy to break her jaw as you think. You haven't got the punch for it. You hit her in the face like a fine, bold fellow you are. And now you want to forgive yourself, and you find you can't, unless I give you your blow back harder than you can hit. Friends, this man is on the way to his salvation. Let us all pray for him. Kneel down, Bill. Get out, will you? Well, kneel down, brother. Get him on his knees. Here! Here, you leave me alone! What do you think I'm made of? Cast iron? Brother, pray with us. Dear Lord, break his stubborn spirit, but don't hurt his dear heart. Never mind my dear heart. How about my ribs? <laughs> Been talking ever since, have you? Pretty nearly. Has uh, Todger paid you out for poor Jenny's jaw? No, he ain't. You want to know where the dirt come from, don't you? Yes. Well, it come off the ground at Tower Bridge, see? It got rubbed off by my shoulders. It's a pity it wasn't rubbed off by your knees. That would have done you a lot of good. I was saving another man's knees at the time. Mind, I did what I said I'd do, spit in his eye. Then Mog said, glory, hallelujah, and he called me brother and down me as if I was a kid and he was my mother, washing me on a Saturday night. Kneeling on me head he was, 14 stone five, praying comfortable with me as a carpet. <laughs> Sir, you were right, Bill. Oh, I wish I'd been there. Yes, yeah, you'd have got in an extra bit of talk on me, wouldn't you? Yes, I'm so sorry, Mr. Walker. Don't you go being sorry for me. What I done, I'll pay for. I tried to get my own jaw broke to satisfy you. Oh, no. I'll tell you I did. And if I can't satisfy you one way, then I can another. Listen, here's my last quid. Now take it, and let's have no more of your forgiving and praying and your major jaw in it. Oh, no, I couldn't take it, Mr. Walker. But if you would give a shilling or two of it to poor Rummy Mitchens. Now, you really did hurt her, and she's old. Not me, not likely. I'd give her another as soon as look at her. She ain't forgiven me. Not much. It's this Christian game of yours I won't have played up against me. I won't have it, I tell you. So take your money and stop throwing your silly bash face up against mine. Major, may I take a little of it for the army? No. The army's not to be bought. Bill, we want your soul 
And we'll take nothing less. I know. Me and my few bob ain't good enough for you. You're an earl's granddaughter, you are. Nothing less than a hundred pound would do for you. Come, Barbara, you could do a great deal of good with a hundred pounds. If you'll set this gentleman's mind at ease by taking his pound, I'll give you the other ninety-nine. Oh, Papa, you're too extravagant. Bill offers twenty pieces of silver. All you need offer is the other ten. That will make the standard price to buy anybody who's for sale. Well, I'm not, and the army's not. Bill. You'll never have another quiet moment until you come round to us. You can't stand out against your salvation. I can't stand out against music or wrestlers and artful tongued women. I've offered to pay and I can't do no more. There it is. Take it or leave it. Mr. Walker, apparently we're in the same boat. Perhaps we can help each other. You'd better come and see me. I don't want none of your charity. It's not charity I'm offering you, it's work. My dear, it was an inspiration to have asked your father here today. God needs him, Major. God needs him. This is my father, General. Try what you can do with him. He won't listen to me because he remembers what a fool I was when I was a baby. <laughs> Have you been shown over the shelter, Mr. Undershaft? You know the work we're doing, of course. The whole nation knows it, madam. No, sir, the whole nation does not know it. Or we should not be crippled as we are for want of money to carry our work through the length and breadth of the land. Let me tell you that there would have been trouble this winter in London, but for us... You really think so? I know it. I remember last year when all you rich gentlemen hardened your hearts against the cry of the poor. They demonstrated outside your clubs in Piccadilly. And actually walked into the Ritz and demanded a meal. I remember very well. Well, won't you help us to get at the people? They won't demonstrate then. Come here, my man. Let me show you to this gentleman. You remember the epidemic of window smashing? Remember it? I was the ringleader, Mum. Would you break windows now? Oh, no, Mum. The windows of heaven have been open to me. I know now that the rich man is a poor sinner like myself. Begging your pardon, Mum. Mr. Price, your mother's asking for you. She's heard about your confession. Go, my friend, go to your mother and pray for her. You can come through the kitchen, Mr. Price. Oh, I couldn't face her now, Mum, not with the weight of my sins fresh on me. Tell her she'll find her son at home, waiting for her in prayer. You see how we take the anger and bitterness out of their hearts, Mr. Landishaw? I do indeed, madam. Who's been bashing whose mother? Barbara, Jenny. I've good news, most wonderful news. Our prayers have been answered. Have we got enough money to keep the shelter open? I hope we shall have enough money to keep all the shelters open. Lord Saxmundham has promised us 50,000 pounds. Hooray! Glory. If... If what? If five other gentlemen will give 10,000 each to make it up to the 100,000. But who is Lord Saxmundham? I never heard of him. A new creation, my dear. Do you ever hear of Sir Horace Bodger? Bodger? Do you mean the distiller? Bodger's whiskey? Yes, that's the man. He's one of the greatest of our public benefactors. He restored the cathedral at Hackington. They made him a baronet for that. He gave half a million to the funds of his party. They made him a viscount for that. What'll they give him for the 50,000? There's nothing left to give him. So the 50,000, I imagine, is to save his soul. Heaven grant it may. Oh, Mr. Rundishaw, you have some very rich friends. Can't you help us towards the other 50,000? Look, we're going to hold a great meeting this evening at the Albert Hall. If I could only announce that one gentleman had come forward to support Lord Saxmundham, others would follow. Don't you know somebody? Couldn't you? Wouldn't you? Oh, think of those poor people, Mr. Rundishaft. Think of how much it means to them and how little to a great man like you. Madam, you're irresistible. I can't disappoint you. And I can't deny myself the satisfaction of making Bodger pay up 
You shall have your 50,000. Thank God. You don't thank me, madam? Hmm? Oh, sir, don't try to be cynical. Don't be ashamed of being a good man. The Lord will bless you abundantly, and our prayers will be like a strong fortification round you all the days of your life. You'll let me have the check to show at the meeting, won't you? Uh, Mr. Duff. Thank you. I prefer my own. Christ's salvation now, okay? Stop! General, are you really going to take this money? Why not, my dear? Why not? Do you know what my father is? Have you forgotten that Lord Saxmundham is Bodger, the whiskey man? Don't you know that the worst thing I've had to fight here is not the devil, but Bodger, Bodger, Bodger! With his whiskey and his distilleries and his tied houses. Rotten drinking whiskey it is, too. Are you going to make this place another tied house and ask me to keep it? Dear Barbara, Lord Saxmundham has a soul to be saved like any of us. I know he has a soul to be saved. Let him come down here and I'll do my best to help him to his salvation. But he wants to send his check down here to buy us and go on being as wicked as ever. My dear Barbara, alcohol is a very necessary article. It heals the sick. He does nothing of the sort. Well, it makes life bearable for millions of people who couldn't enjoy their existence if they were quite sober. It enables Parliament to do things at 11 o'clock at night, which no sane person would do at 11 o'clock in the morning. Is it Bodger's fault if this inestimable gift is deplorably abused by less than 1% of the poor? Barbara, will there be less drinking or more if all those poor souls we are saving come tomorrow and find the doors of the shelter shut in their faces? Lord Saxmundham gives us this money to stop drinking, to take his own business from him. Pure self-sacrifice on Bodger's part, clearly. Bless dear Bodger. I also, General, may claim a little disinterestedness. Think of my business. Think of the widows and orphans, the oceans of blood, not one drop of which is shed in a really just cause. All this makes money for me. I'm never busier, never richer than when the papers are full of it. Well, it's your work to pitch peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Every convert you make is a vote against war. Yet, I give you this money to help hasten my own commercial ruin. The millennium will be inaugurated by the unselfishness of Undershaft and Bodger. Oh, be joyful! Oh, what an infinite goodness one finds in everything. Who would have thought that any good could come out of war and drink. Oh, dear, how blessed, how glorious it all is. A miracle. Let us seize this unspeakable moment. Let us march to the great meeting at once. Our shelter saved. Hooray! The army saved. Let's oh, the Mr. Undershaft, have you ever seen 5,000 people fall on their knees with one impulse and pray? Come with us to the meeting. Barbara shall tell them that the army is saved and saved through you. You shall carry the flag down the first street, General. Mr. Undershaft is a gifted trombonist. He shall march with us, blasting us to high heaven. Blow, Machiavelli, blow! I'll do my best. I could vamp a bass if I knew the tune. It's a wedding chorus from Donizetti's operas. But we've converted it. We convert everything here. Including Bodger. You remember the chorus? For the immense rejoicing, immense soul jubilo, immense soul jubilo. Rum, dum, de, dum, dum. Dolly, you're breaking my heart. What's a broken heart, more or less, here? 
St. Undershaft and St. Bulger have descended, the patron saints of peace and temperance. I am possessed! Come, Barbara. I must have my dear Major to carry the flag with me. Yes, yes, dear Major. I can't come. Come. Barbara, do you think I'm wrong to take this money? No, no. God help you, you must. You're saving the army. Go, go, and may you have a great meeting. But aren't you coming? No. Barbara, what are you doing? Major, you can't be going to leave us. Father, come here. My dear. No, don't be frightened. There. It's not much for 50,000 pounds, is it? Barbara, if you won't come and pray with us, promise me you'll pray for us. I can't pray now. Perhaps I shall never pray again. Barbara! Right. I can't bear any more. Barbara! Quick, march! Come on, Machiavelli! I must go now, my dear. You're overworked. You'll be all right tomorrow. We'll never lose you. Now, Jenny, step out with the old flag. Blood and fire. Glory, hallelujah! Glory, hallelujah! Hey, up there! Immenso Jubilo! Drunkenness and murder. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? What price salvation now? Don't you hit her when she's done. She hit me when I was done. Why shouldn't I get a bit of my own bit? Here, where's my money gone? Blimey, if Jenny Hill didn't tuck it off her all. You lie, you dirty blackguard! Shrubby Price pinched it. I see him do it. What's all my money? Why didn't you call free for him, you silly old muck of you? You had for eating me across the face. That's cost you a pound, that has. Mm -hmm. I've done ya. I got even with ya. I am it out to you. <laughs> you can't afford to lose it, Bill. I'll send it to you. Not if I was to starve for it. I ain't to be bought. Ain't ya? Sell yourself to the devil for a pint of beer. So I would, and often have, cheerful. But she can't buy me. You wanted my soul, did you? Well, you ain't got it. I nearly got it, dear. But we've sold it back to you for 50,000 pounds. A dear at the money! No, it was worth more than money. It's no good. You can't get round me now. I don't believe in it. And I've seen today that I was right. So long, old soup kitchener. ta -da, Major Earl's granddaughter. What price salvation now? Snobby price. Cook! Goodbye, Bill. Get out. That's all right, you know. Nothing personal. No malice. So long. Judy? No malice. So long, Bill. 
All clear, Rummy. He's gone. You make too much of him, miss, in your innocence. Better too much than too little, Rummy. Yes, miss. God forgive me. Let's go, Peter. Like you now, cleaned out, and lost my job. If you don't know, that's two better than me. I'll get you a job, Peter. That's hope for you. The youth will have to be enough for me. I've just enough left for two good teas and my bus home. Don't be proud, Peter. It's sharing between friends. Promise me you'll talk to me and not let me cry. which we must not forget. God has answered our prayers wonderfully by sending us a great gift, one that will enable us to get through many winters as bitter as this one has been, without stinting one of his children of their little ration of bread and milk and their warm blanket in the shelter. You all know the name of the nobleman who, under God, was the instrument of the first half of that gift. You will pray for him and rejoice in his salvation. Glory! God bless Lord Saxmundum. You do not know the name of that other generous servant of God who has made up the whole sum for us. And I must not tell it to you, for he is one of those who does not let his right hand know what his left hand doeth. Friends, he is here among us tonight. This afternoon, when he announced his magnificent offering to me, I exclaimed, thank God. He smiled and said, you do not thank me. <laughs> I told him to come to this meeting, and he would hear how we thanked him. He has come, and you have kept my word for me. <laughs> my friends, you may not know him on this side of the grave, but when we cross the river over there, 
He will be there with a still. And you will know him by the seal of God on his brow. Lord. We will now sing our old favorite, Abide With Me. Have supper with me at my flat. I've got something to say to you. We'll pick up a cab outside. Yes, but I must call at Milton Crescent to ask if Barbara's got home safe. Never mind Barbara. She can look after herself and her uniform will protect her better than ten policemen. Come on. It's about Barbara. I want to talk to you. your game. I've been watching you. Don't try throwing yourself after that bonnet and giving me the trouble of fishing you out because you won't be let do it, see? That's what you thought, is it? Even if I wanted to throw away my life, I wouldn't risk yours. You'll excuse me, miss, but are you quite yourself this evening? I'm not at all sure. walked a very long way and I've become quite tired suddenly. Do you think you could find me a taxi to take me home? Taxi, miss? What you want by the look of you is an ambulance. Yourself, my friend. Have some brandy. No, thanks. I'll have some water. My throat's still dry. I don't know how to sing, and the result of my attempts at the meetings is always incipient laryngitis. <laughs> oh! Oh! How to set the chimney on fire? But my throat. What on earth is it? It's all right. It's only <laughs> vodka. It won't hurt you. <laughs> Try some of that temperance burgundy. It will wash away the steam. <laughs> You may call it a temperance burgundy, sir, but I should be sorry to venture on more than one glass of it myself. Nonsense. After that awful stuff, it's like milk. Steady, steady. My burgundy isn't as mild as it seems. Oh, are you all right? Perfectly. Good. You don't mind if I get rid of this? That means you're getting rid of Barbara. <coughs> Not at all. Yes, she refused to swallow Bodger's whiskey. Do you think she's any more likely to swallow your money in gunpowder? She's swallowed a good deal of it already, my friend. What do you suppose she's been living on all these years? You think you'll end by making me swallow them, don't you? Both of you will have to swallow them. They're mystical powers above and behind the three of us that will make short work of your scruples. Do you think I don't know all about the mystical powers, Machiavelli? You remember what Euripides said about your money and gunpowder? No. One and another in money and guns may outpass his brother. 
And then in their millions float and flow and seed with a million hopes at level. And they win their will or they miss their will. And their hopes are dead or are pined for still. But where can know as the long days go that to live is happy as found is heaven? It's my translation. What do you think of it? I think, my friend, that if you wish to know as the long days go that to live is happy, you must first acquire money enough for a decent life and power enough to be your own master. Mm, you're damnably discouraging. What else is wisdom? What a man's endeavor or God's high grace so lovely and so great. To stand from fear set free, to breathe and wait. To hold a hand uplifted over fate. And shall not Barbara be loved forever? Oh, Euripides mentions Barbara, does he? It's a fair translation. The word means loveliness. And may I ask as Barbara's father, how much a year she is to be loved forever on? As Barbara's father, that's more your affair than mine. I can feed her by teaching Greek, that's about all. Do you consider it a good match for her? Mr. Undershaft, I am in many ways a weak, timid, ineffectual person, and my health is far from satisfactory. But whenever I feel I must have anything, I get it, sooner or later. I feel that way about Barbara. I don't like marriage. I feel intensely afraid of it. I don't know what I shall do with Barbara or what she'll do with me. But I feel that I and nobody else must marry her. Please regard that as settled. Oh, not that I wish to be arbitrary, but why should I waste your time in discussing what's inevitable? You mean you'll stick at nothing? Precisely. Professor Cousins, you're a young man after my own heart. Mr. Undershaft, you are, as far as I'm able to gather, a most infernal old rascal. But you appeal very strongly to my sense of ironic humor. Good. We shall get on well together. Have you ever thought about going into business? My business? Money and gunpowder? Never. Barbara's money will come from it. Why not help to earn it? Have you thought of that at all? I, uh, I... Look here, Machiavelli. I am interested in thought reading and have, in fact, made some experiments in it, but I object to your trying it on me. When my head is clear, I'll tell you exactly what I think. Just at present, I'm in a state of exaltation. I don't know why. Perhaps the excitement of that meeting. The room is very hot. Might we have a window open for a moment? Certainly. James, mm -hmm. I should like a breath of fresh air myself. Certainly. Uh, draw back those curtains and open the window, will you? It's a very windy night, sir. So much the better. It's only for a moment. Lend a hand, will you? <laughs> Quick! Right, sir. I'm afraid he's here for the night, sir. Nobody down yet? <clears throat> Mr. Stevens down, the lady, and had his breakfast. Miss Barbara's gone out, I suppose. No, but lady, Miss Barbara is, is not up yet. Not up yet? Are you sure? Quite sure, lady. Miss Barbara came in late last night and said she was not to be called. Not to be called? Was she quite well? A, a little pale, my lady, and without her bonnet. I, I hadn't much time to notice. She went straight upstairs and left me to settle with the policeman and the ambulance. Policeman? Ambulance? There must have been some accident. Are you certain she wasn't hurt? I can assure you she was quite all right, my lady. Well. What have you laid all those extra places for? You're expecting Mr. Cousins and Mr. Lomax. The car's ordered for half past ten to take the party to, uh, to, um... Well? To where? 
to Mr. Andershaft's place, I think, milady. To the factory, you mean? <laughs> yes, milady. The factory pays your wages, Morrison. Yes, milady, that is what factories are for. You must put up with them. Uh, bacon and eggs, milady, as usual? No, I'll have a sausage this morning. Yes, milady. Ah, breakfast. Oh, good morning, Lady Bridget. You're late, Charles. Mm. Where's Adolphus? I haven't the faintest idea. Morning, darling. Morrison, we're starving. Ah, bacon and eggs. Sausages. Sausages, good. Uh, no kidneys, Morrison. Kidneys, sir. Ah. Yeah. Thank heaven for the English breakfast. You know, as I always say, the one drawback about going abroad... Charles Lomax, if it must dribble, dribble like a grown-up man and not like a schoolboy. Uh, dribble is dribble, you know, whatever a man's age. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Barbara. Morning. Good heavens, you've chucked the uniform. You mean that Barbara's changed her dress, Charles. Why not say so? Charlie means exactly what he says, Mother. Please, let's drop the subject. Oh, I... Uh... I'm awfully sorry, Barbara. You'll get over it, you know. Personally, I, I never shut my eyes to the fact that there's a certain amount of tosh about the Salvation Army. On the other hand... That's enough, Charles. Speak of something suited to your mental capacity. Thank you for your sympathy, Charlie. Now, go and flirt with Sarah. Darling. Oh, Barbara, I wish you wouldn't tell Charlie to do things. He always comes straight away and does them. Good morning, Lady Britt. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Just some water, please, Morrison. With ice in it. I say, old boy, did you have a bad night? No, I had a very good night. In fact, one of the most remarkable nights I ever passed. The meeting? No, after the meeting. You ought to have gone to bed after the meeting. What were you doing? Drinking. Charlie! I say! What were you drinking, may I ask? A most devilish Russian spirit. I believe it was vodka. Are you joking, Dolly? No. I've been making a night of it with the nominal head of this household, that's all. Andrew made you drunk? No, he just provided the drink. To tell you the truth, I've never been quite drunk before. I rather liked it last night. I told you I was possessed. Possessed? You're not sober yet. Go home to bed at once. I've never before ventured to reproach you, Lady Britt, but how could you marry the Prince of Darkness? It was much more excusable to marry him than to get drunk with him. That's a new accomplishment of Andrew's, by the way. He usen't to drink. He doesn't know, although he had an admirable excuse for doing so last night. You see, he'd just given away 50,000 pounds. Given away? Yes, to the Salvation Army. And he insisted upon remaining anonymous. That was rather fine, the old boy, you know. Most chaps would have wanted the advertisement. He said all the charitable institutions would be down in him like kites in a battlefield if he gave his name. That's Andrew all over. Never does a proper thing without giving an improper reason for it. He convinced me that I have all my life been doing improper things for proper reasons. Mr. Undershaft has just arrived. He's in the drawing room, my lady. Children, go and get ready. Your father doesn't like to be kept waiting. Adolphus! Now that Barbara's left the Salvation Army, you had better leave it too. I will not have you playing that drum in the streets. Your order is already obeyed, Lady Bill. How fortunate to see you alone. Don't be sentimental, Andrew. Sit down. Sarah must have 800 a year until Charles comes into his property. Barbara will need more, need it permanently, because Adolphus hasn't any property. Yes, my dear, I shall see to it. Anything else for yourself, for instance? I want to talk to you about Stephen. Don't, my dear, Stephen doesn't interest me. He does interest me. He's our son. Do you really think so? Andrew, don't be aggravating and don't be wicked. At present, you're both. Do you pretend that Stephen couldn't carry on the foundry, just as well as all the other sons of big business houses? Yes, he could learn the office routine without understanding the business like all the other sons. Stephen is the most steady, capable, high-minded young man. You're simply trying to find an excuse for disinheriting him. My dear, the undershaft tradition disinherits him. But I must admit it's landed me in a difficulty. As you yourself remark, I'm getting on in years, and I haven't found a fit successor yet. 
There is Steve. That's just it. All the foundlings I can find are exactly like Stephen. I want a man with no relations and no schooling. That is, a man would be out of the running altogether if he weren't a strong man. And I can't find him. If you want to keep the business in the family, you'd better find an eligible foundling and marry him to Barbara. You'd sacrifice stealing to Barbara? Cheerfully. Come, Biddy. Don't call me Biddy. I don't call you Andy. And your tie's all on one side. Put it straight. Oh, I beg your pardon. Hello, uh, no. come in, Stephen. Good morning. I understand you want to come into the cannon business. I going to trade? Certainly not. Cannons are not trade, Stephen. They're national enterprise. I have no intention of becoming a man of business in any sense. I intend to devote myself to politics. My dear boy, this is an immense relief to me, and I trust it may prove an equally good thing for the country. Stephen, I cannot allow you to throw away an enormous property like this. Mother, there must be an end of treating me as a child, if you please. Any further discussions had better take place with my father as between one man and another. Stephen! I'm sorry, Mother, that I you have forced... I quite understand, Stephen. By all means, go your own way. If you feel strong enough, you see, my dear, it's only the big men who can be treated like children. All right, Stephen, your independence is achieved. You've won your latchkey. Now, what about your future as between one man and another? It's settled that you don't ask for succession to the cannon business. I hope it is settled that I repudiate the cannon business. My dear boy, don't be so devilish sulky. Freedom should be generous. Besides, I owe you a fair start in life in exchange for disinheriting you. You can't become Prime Minister all at once, you know. Haven't you a turn for something? What about literature, art and so forth? I have nothing of the artist about me, either in faculty or character, thank heaven. A philosopher, perhaps? I make no such ridiculous pretension. Just so. Well, then there's the army, the navy, church and the bar. The bar requires some ability. What about the bar? I'm afraid I haven't the necessary push. I believe that is the name the barristers give their vulgarity for success in pleading. Rather a difficult case, Stephen. Hardly anything left but the stage, is there? Well, is there anything you know or care for? I know the difference between right and wrong. You don't say so. What? No capacity for business? No knowledge of law? No sympathy with art, no pretension to philosophy, only a simple knowledge of the secret that has baffled all the lawyers, muddled all the men of business, and ruined most of the artists, the secret of right and wrong. Why, man, you're a genius, a master of masters, a god. And at 28, too. You are pleased to be facetious. I pretend to nothing more than any honorable Englishman claims as his birthright. Oh, very well, have it your own way. You know nothing and you think you know everything. That points clearly to a political career. We'll get you a private secretaryship to someone who can get you an under-secretaryship and you'll find your natural and proper place in the end on the Treasury bench. I'm sorry, sir, that you forced me to forget the respect due to you as my father. I am an Englishman and I will not hear the government of my country insulted. The government of your country. I am the government of your country. I and Lazarus. Do you suppose that you and half a dozen amateurs like you, sitting in a row in that foolish gabble shop, can govern a country like England? Be off with you, my boy, and play with your historic parties and leading articles and burning questions and the rest of your toys. And in return, you shall have the support and applause of my newspapers and the delight of imagining that you're a great statesman. Really, my dear father, <laughs> it's quite impossible to be angry with you. I suppose it is natural for you to think that money governs England, but you must allow me to think I know better. And what does govern England, pray? Character, Father. Character. Uh, whose character? Yours or mine? Neither yours nor mine, Father. But the best elements in the English national character... Stephen, I found your profession for you. You're a born journalist. We must get you a job on the Times. Stephen. Yes, and don't forget you've outgrown your mother. Morning, Morrison. 
Shall we see you again this evening, sir? I have your room ready for you. No, by George. You look a little pale, my dear. I've made you unhappy, haven't I? Do you understand what you've done to me? Yesterday, I had a man's soul in my hand. I set him in the way of life with his face to salvation. And when we took your money, he turned back again to drunkenness and derision. I'll never forgive you there. Never. Does my daughter despair so easily? Can you strike a man to the heart and leave no mark on him? You forget, my dear. Bill Walker spat in Todger's eye to save his honor. He gave up his hard-earned pound to save his soul. Do you know what a pound means to such a man? It's your faith that's failing, not his. Will he ever strike a woman again as he struck Jenny Hill? You've sent him on the road to his salvation. It may not be your road, but he won't turn back. Oh, yes, you're right. He can never be lost now. Where's my faith? Oh, clever, clever devil. You may be a devil, but... God speaks through you sometimes. You've given me back my happiness. I can feel it deep down now, though my spirit is troubled. You've learned something, my dear. That always feels at first as if you'd lost something. What have Barbara and I got to do with your factory of death? That's what I ask myself. I've always thought of it as a sort of pit where lost creatures with blackened faces stirred up smoking fires and were driven and tormented by my father. Is it like that, Papa? My dear, you'll see for yourself. Or construction? How about railway lines, for instance? Plato? Plato? You dare quote a Greek philosopher to me? Plato says, my friend, that society cannot be saved until either the professors of Greek take to making gunpowder, or else the makers of gunpowder become professors of Greek. Predecessors, the old swordsmiths, used the same stuff, boiling steel. Have you found anything discreditable? No. Nope. The men call him Dandy Andy, and a proud is a cunning old rascal. Well, 
driving me against my nature. I hate war. Hatred is the card's revenge for being intimidated. Dare you make war on war? Here are the means. Understand this, you old demon. You have me in a horrible dilemma. I want Barbara. Like most young men, greatly exaggerate the difference between one young woman and another. Quite true, Dolly. I refuse to walk another step through all these sheds and pipes and boilers. They mean nothing to me. I've never asked you to come and look at the kitchen range and the scullery sink. Why is that roof making a noise like a whale with asthma? It's breathing, my love. Come and see. This is ridiculous. Is it snow or salt or what? Nitrates to make explosives or sulfates to fertilize your fields. If you prefer the explosive way, that's your affair, not mine. Come, Euripides. You think that nitrates are good for nothing but death. Now I'll show you the sort of life they produce. My workers live. Here they own everything and I own nothing. Sort of cooperative touch, huh? Exactly, Mr. Lomax. It makes it very difficult for them to leave my employment, but then they don't want to leave it. Why? Because they can't better themselves, my love. Slavery, I call it. Do you, my dear? One. Exactly, Mr. Lomax. It's a result of our belief in religious freedom. Its official name is the meeting place of all the religions. The men call it Piety Square. Are you sure that all this pampering is really good for the men's characters? My dear boy, when you're organizing civilization, you have to make up your mind whether trouble and anxiety are good things or not. If you decide that they are, then I take it you simply don't organize civilization. Good morning. However, our characters are safe here. A sufficient dose of anxiety is always provided by the fact that we may all be blown to smithereens at any moment. Well? Not a ray of hope. Everything perfect, wonderful, real. It only needs a cathedral to be a heavenly city instead of a hellish one. And to think of all that being yours. And you've kept it yourself all these years. It doesn't belong to me. I belong to it. It's the undershaft inheritance. It is not. Your ridiculous cannons and that noisy banging foundry may be the undershaft inheritance. But all that plate and linen, all those houses and orchards and gardens, they belong to us. They belong to me. They're not a man's business. I won't give them up. What lovely flowers. Never mind about the flowers, Andrew. You're trying to put me off the subject of the inheritance. Well, you shan't. I don't ask it any longer, Miss Stephen. He's inherited far too much of your perversity to be fit for it. But Barbara has rights as well as Stephen. Why should not Adolphus succeed to the inheritance? I should ask nothing better if Adolphus were a foundling. He's exactly the sort of new blood that's wanted in English business. But he's not a foundling, and there's an end of it. Not quite. I think, my, I'm not committing myself in any way as to my future course, but I think the foundling difficulty can be got over. What do you mean? Well, I have something to say which is in the nature of a confession. A confession? Yes, a confession. Listen, all of you. Won't you sit down? Until I met Barbara, I thought myself in the main an honorable, truthful man, because I wanted the approval of my conscience more than I wanted anything else. 
But the moment I saw Barbara, I wanted her far more than the approval of my conscience. Adolphus! I thought she was a woman of the people. And the marriage with a professor of Greek would be far beyond the wildest social ambitions of her rank. Adolphus! No, really. <laughs> when I learnt the horrible truth... What do you mean by the horrible truth, pray? That she was enormously rich, that her grandfather was an earl, that her father was the Prince of Darkness, and that I was only an adventurer trying to catch a rich wife. Then I stooped to deceive her about my birth. Dolly, your birth. Now, Adolphus, don't dare to make up a wicked story for the sake of these wretched talents. Remember, I've seen photographs of your parents. And the agent general for Southwestern Australia knows them personally and has assured me they're the most respectable married people. Oh, so they are in Australia, but here they're outcasts. Their marriage is legal in Australia, but not in England. My mother is my father's deceased wife's sister. And in this island, I'm consequently a foundling. I think not. You can marry your wife's sister, even in England. Ah, you can now, but not when my parents married. Is the subterfuge good enough, Machiavelli? You're an educated man. That's against the tradition. Greek hasn't destroyed my mind. It's nourished it. Besides, I didn't learn it in an English public school. Biddy, this may be a way out of the difficulty. Stop! A man cannot make canons any better for being his own cousin instead of his proper self. Well, I can't afford to be too particular. He's cornered the foundling market. Let it pass. You're eligible, Euripides. You're eligible. You know that you'll have to change your name. Do you object to that? Would any man named Adolphus, any man called Dolly, object to being called something else? Hardly. Now, as to money, I propose to treat you handsomely from the beginning. You shall start at a thousand a year. A thousand? You dare offer a miserable thousand to the son-in-law of a millionaire? No, by heavens, Machiavelli, you shall not cheat me. You can't do without me, and I can do without you. I must have, uh, 2,500 pounds a year for two years. At the end of that time, if I'm a failure, I go. But if I'm a success and stay on, you must give me the other 5,000. What other 5,000? To, to, to make the two years up to 5,000 a year. The 2,500 is only half pay, in case I should turn out a failure. The third year, I must have, uh, 10% of the profits. 10 per Do you know what my profits are? Enormous, I hope. Otherwise, I shall require 25%. But, Mr. Cousins, this is a serious matter of business. You're not bringing any capital into the concern? What? No capital? Is my mastery of Greek no capital? Is my access to the subtlest thought, the loftiest poetry yet attained by humanity, no capital? My character, my intellect, my life, my career? And what Barbara calls my soul. Are these no capital? Say another word and I double my salary. Be reasonable. Mr. Undershaft, you have my terms. Take them or leave them. Very well. I note your terms and I offer you half. Half? Half. You call yourself a gentleman and you offer me half? I don't call myself a gentleman, but I offer you half. This to your future partner, your successor, your son-in-law? Leave me out of the bargain, please, darling. You're selling your own soul, not mine. Come, I'll go a step further for Barbara's sake. I'll give you three-fifths, but that's my last word. Done. Done in the eye. <sighs> By the way, Mac, I'm a classical scholar, not an arithmetical one. Is three-fifths more than half or less? More, of course. I'd have taken 250. How you can succeed in business when you're willing to pay all that money to a university professor obviously isn't worth a junior clerk's wages. Well, what did Lazarus say? He'll be blamed for your opacity in money matters, poor fellow, as he said that you've been blamed for mine. You're a shark of the first order, you Euripides. <laughs> so much the better for the firm. Dolly, old fellow, think, think before you decide. Do you feel that you're a sufficiently practical man? It's a huge undertaking. An enormous responsibility. All this mass of business will be Greek to you. I think it'll be much less difficult than Greek. Bill! Hello, Judy. What do you think of it? Got myself a job. Three pounds, ten a week. How that for salvation, eh? Barbara. You understand, don't you, that I had to decide without consulting you? If I'd left this choice to you, you'd sooner or later have despised me for it. 
Your father's challenge has beaten me. Dare I make war on war? I dare. I must. I will. And now, is it all over between us? Silly baby, darling. How could it be? Then you... you oh, for my drum! Take care, darling. Take care. Oh, if only I could get away from you, from father and from it all. And leave me? Yes. I can't. I was happy for a moment in the Salvation Army. But as soon as our money ran short, it all came back to Bodger. Undershaft and Bodger. Their hands stretch everywhere. And as long as that lasts, there's no getting away from them. Turning our backs on them is turning our backs on life. Do you know what would have happened if you'd refused Papa's offer? I wonder. I should have given you up and married the man who'd accepted it. After all, my dear old mother's got more sense than any of you. I felt like her when I saw this place. Felt that I must have it. That never, never, never could I let it go. Only she thought it was all the houses and the kitchen ranges and the linen and the china. But it was really all the human souls to be saved. Not weak souls in starved bodies, sobbing with gratitude for a scrap of bread and scrape but souls that are hungry because their bodies are full. My father shall never throw it in my teeth again that my converts were bribed with bread. I have got rid of the bribe of bread. I have got rid of the bribe of heaven. Let God's work be done for its own sake. The work that he had to create us to do because it cannot be done except by living men and women. Then the way of life lies through the factory of death. Yes through the raising of hell to heaven and of man to God, through the unveiling of an eternal light in the valley of the shadow. Oh, did you think that my courage would never come back? Did you believe that I was a deserter? That I, who have stood in the streets and taken my people to my heart and talked of the greatest and holiest of things with them, could ever turn back and chatter foolishly to fashionable people about nothing in a drawing room? Never, 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 never. Sooner than that, I'd sweep out the gun cotton sheds or be one of Bodger's barmaids. Major Barbara will die with the colors. Glory, hallelujah. Mama! Mama! Well, what does she say? She's gone right up into the skies. Mama! Well, Barbara, what do you want? A house in the village to live in with Dolly. <laughs> Stop her, Joe, or you'll die for your time. War out, that's what you'll be, war out. <laughs> <laughs>